Hello and welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we're talking about some spoilers about everything. My voice might sound a little different because I'm very sick, but I'm Ashley. And live from the closet as usual, I'm Alex. And uh, let's start, as usual, by asking, what is new to you, Alex? Um, I've been playing a lot of Mass Effect Andromeda. Okay, okay, um, you know I have to ask you. <laughs> what are the animations like? Did they fix it? Because I saw some videos that looked pretty absurd. So, if they did fix it, I haven't, like, I, I'm not aware if they fixed it or not. What I've noticed well, is they're yeah, not... I think you'd be aware if they didn't fix it, because those videos looked crazy. They are crazy, um, but, <laughs> I don't know, it, 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 they're not, it's not all that, like, because the videos make it look really glitchy. If anything, mm. it's just doesn't synchronize, and it's not, like, the correct facial expressions for the tone of the... Well, like, what I saw, like, there just weren't any facial expressions or anything, and, like, people were walking around all crazy and bow-legged. Like, it didn't look, it didn't look real. Like, it didn't look like a game studio made it. It looked like some, like, student experiment. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was so funny. Yeah, there, it's, it's, I've not encountered too many points where I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous. It's a lot of just, like, this is noticeable. It's noticeably bad. That's so, such a shame. And and more so than the animations at some points, it's the textures of the faces that are really weird. Huh. So like they're they're all really matte, but also not detailed. Whereas in the previous Mass Effects, they were shiny because human skin is shiny a lot of time, um, <laughs> and also very detailed. So you could see like complexion and marks and and everything, which. Yeah. Some people might not like, but I thought it was sort of their style. Okay, yeah. But this is the opposite of that. It's like, <laughs> I, I, some some video person or, or podcast person said they looked like Sims 3 characters, and they totally... Oh my god, like those puffy faces? Yes, they do, and it's, and it's also sad because some of the Asari, the blue, the blue alien yeah. race, they don't look as good either, and it's... What happened? Like, I, why is it of such lower quality than the previous Mass Effect games? I, I honestly think they started from scratch rather than building on what they had. And another, I was just watching a, a review from Total Biscuit, the Cynical Brit. Um, mm. And he had like an hour, 45 minute review of it or first impressions or whatever. And he said, he was, he was remarking on how beautiful the environments are. <laughs> and he, it, he's not wrong. Like, the environments are gorgeous, and they take up a lot of the gameplay. But those faces... See, for me, the past six, six days have been... Sick days. I've been, been so ill. Actually, yesterday was the worst of it. Today, I'm, I'm starting to pull out of it. I still sound all funky, but I feel a lot better. Um, so, so I've actually just been sort of laying in bed watching old episodes of Adventure Time. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a good one to watch. Because it's not like... You don't have to devote any attention to the story necessarily. Yeah, and it's just these nice short little snippets. It's comfortable. It's fun. And then I even watched that great episode where where Jake is sick and Finn has to go and find a story to tell him to make him better. And I was like, I get you. I get you, Jake. But before I became dreadfully ill, I went and saw uh, the My Brother, My Brother and Me live show in Portland. You told me about that. Little shout out there to one of the best podcasts of all time. Like, they don't need our endorsement because everyone loves My Brother, My Brother, and Me, but I'm putting it out there right now. It's so good. Those guys are so funny. If you don't, if anyone listening to this, if you haven't listened to My Brother, My Brother, and Me, go do it because you will be so sad you didn't do it before. Uh, it was such a good time. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, Sarah. My dear angel of a friend, thank you so, so much for bringing me with you. That was the best time ever. Um, but I got to have my own little Portland adventure, uh, calling back to your Portland adventure last time. Uh-huh. My Portland adventure did not go as well oh, as no. yours did. 
Southeast Portland is the worst place to drive. Oh my god. Because it was at the Revolution Hall, and um, luckily, my friend's apartment is just right by it, so I just got to, like, go to her house and hang out for a while, and then we walked there. Um, So I didn't have to, like, drive out of their parking lot or whatever, find street parking, like, near them at the time. Like, it could have been a lot worse, but trying to get back to I-5 South from her place was impossible. It took me, like, 20 minutes driving around, missing turns to find the damn freeway. Oh, my God. (laughs) It was terrible. It was just the worst. But, uh, yeah, just having been sick, I don't have a lot to share as far as what I've been up to. Oh, I finally did see um, Doctor Strange. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed good. it. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely say there were some uh, there were some flaws, certainly. Um, I feel like some, some scenes are a bit gratuitous. Like, if you actually condense them down to, like, their actual content, there's very little there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, like, some of the, like, crazy, foldy, fractal city scenes really, um, didn't make sense as far as, like, the story goes. Oh, yeah, there was absolutely no plot in some of the major fight scenes. Yeah, and, well, like... like not, not, that, not that they have to have plot, but, like... The hint of justification. Yeah, uh-huh. Like, when Caecilius is chasing him around, when, like, Steven's like, Mirror world, now you can't do anything. And uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor is like, bad move, he can kill us real good in the mirror world. Um, <laughs> and then they just start running, and it's like, okay, where are you running to? And why are you being so bad at killing them, Caecilius, if you're, like, super duper strong here? Like, why are they able to run away from you for so long to nowhere? Like, what's going on in this scene? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, I mean... Benedict is is Benedict, so there's that, and and Mads, of course, by now already everybody knows how much I love Mads, so I'd watch anything he was in, one, and I loved every little, moment of his screen time. One little tidbit about uh, Benedict's American accent: it oh, sounds yeah. identical to Hugh Laurie's American accent on House. Identical. You know what? I entirely disagree. I thought his what? American accent was not very good. Oh, neither of them are, are that good, but I just say they sound the same. Are you serious? I think Hugh Laurie is amazing. Like, I think he's super, well, super good know. at an accent. I just, they just sounded similar to me. Well, yeah, they, they have a similar sort of tone of voice, um, I think. Well, because they, they have to overcompensate on certain vowels and things. Yeah, things got a little funny uh, sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely heard some some slipping up on Cumberbatch's if, if part. You watch again, if you watch it again, you'll notice even more. Yeah, well, and I just, I really have an ear for that kind of thing. Like, I pay attention because I'm really fascinated by accents and dialects. So I was like, all right, Benedict, how are you going to do? And it was passable. It was passable. Not not the best I've heard. The best I've heard is Hugh Dancy in Hannibal. So there's that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, 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 oh, I forget every time that he, that he has a... a a non-American accent normally. He's oh, he's super posh British. He's got like a middle class like posh, no, and I, rich boy accent. Because he's so good, he's so good at, at doing an American accent. I did watch one episode. Oh, you did. And it wasn't horrifying, but it was in the middle of the day. And and it, to get around my little weirdness about it, I had to watch it in like the living room rather than on my computer. <laughs> so I had like. I don't know, breathing room. <laughs> okay, well, before we get into the episode, um, what, what, what did you watch? Which, which episode did you watch? It was, I want to say it's like six or seven of season one, and it, and it was the one with the guy who had a brain tumor, and he was, like, turning people into angels. Oh, yeah, that's a pretty cool one. And that was interesting. My mom <laughs> walked in, was going to watch some with me, and then she, she yeah, I think it was a bit too much for her. Even though she, like, loves Walking Dead and, and Game of Thrones. So it's a little know. different. It is. It's a little, it's a, it is a little different, yeah. I mean, just psychologically, because it's like, yeah, Walking Dead's awful, but it's just like, well, okay, there are zombies, and they're falling apart in their corpses, and they're going to come get you, so you got to fight them. But Game of Thrones, you know, there's some brutal stuff, but nothing too, like, I don't know, like, twisted? I guess. Whereas Hannibal, it's like, okay, how about some psychopaths just doing yeah. horrible mutilations to people? Like, that's that's a whole other thing. Quick little side note. Yeah. I was watching Sesame Street with my, uh, I want to say, like, 15-month-old niece. She has such a cute little pumpkin head, by the way. Oh my God. She's <laughs> the most adorable. Her new word is, in- instead of saying, yeah, 
for affirmative. She goes, yeah. <laughs> ah, oh my god. Um, but anyway, we're watching Sesame Street, and some episodes have, like, these um, sort of parodies of really popular shows. And there was a Walking Dead parody. And I was like, how is this what? And, and, it, and the it was called the Gingerbread Walking or something like that like the walking gingerbread man or something like that and it was just like oh, it was ridiculous that's, that's really bizarre that's really bizarre i love that though when you just see something in a children's show where you're just like what why did you put this in here like how did you get away with that and why did you think you all right and it made me curious too so i googled to see if they had a um a uh, Game of Thrones one, and they apparently they did do a Game of Thrones one. It was like Game of Chairs, and they were playing like musical chairs. <laughs> That's so funny. It's adorable, but it's also like, who okayed that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the thing with that is, like, that's going to go over the children's heads, um, but, but then the, the parents, parents are going to see and be like, that's rad, like, I love this. So I guess that's the idea, but um, we should get into today's topic, which is basically adaptations of classics. That's a, you know, tried and true sort of formula for, for coming up with new stuff, um, and speaking of our dear friend Benedict Cumberbatch... We should start by sort of talking about the most popular current classic adaptation, which is Sherlock. Yeah, um, I'm not up to date on Sherlock. Oh, so you haven't watched, like, the latest season? I haven't seen maybe even the latest two of them. I don't remember. They come out so infrequently that it's hard to know where they're at now. I think How I many years first... has it been since I watched Sherlock? Hmm. Like nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I gotta say, like... Yeesh, this last season you didn't miss much like honestly it would be interesting to talk about um just because i have so many issues with it but oh yeah that's why i stopped watching it my um partner at the time had a lot of we had a lot of discussions about what was wrong with it and once you sort of do that sort of critical analysis of shows and and Sometimes it can it can really put you off, and I think that's yeah. what I, I I admit I haven't read any of the Sherlock Holmes books, but I mean, isn't it supposed to be smart? Not yeah. Just... Well, and here's the interesting thing. So I um I have read uh, Study in Scarlet, which is what the very very first episode is based on. A Study in Pink. Yeah. Um, and it's very close. It's very 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 close to. Um, the, the the book and the show, like the book and the episode, it's there's it's I mean it, it's a very faithful modernization and adaptation of what's going on there, and even there's some sort of fun little twists and jabs at it because if you remember the scene when they're first investigating the crime scene and um, there's the uh, the the body and they've written R A C H E in blood and. Uh, it was his name Anderson, the douchebag guy. <laughs> he's like a Rache. That means revenge in German. And Sherlock's like, get out. And he's like, no, it's it's, it's, it's someone was writing Rachel. Um, in the book, someone is like, I found the word R A C H E written here. Uh, someone was writing Rachel. And Sherlock's like, don't be stupid. Rache oh, so is revenge in German. And they like flipped <laughs> it. And so it was a very funny little moment there to like acknowledge and flip what was going on there. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, it's, it's very, very, very close. Like it, the book starts out, um, with John being like, yeah, so I went to war and like a bunch of bad stuff happened to me. Like it was a really, really terrible time. And so I was discharged and I went and I sort of moped around for a while. And then I went to London because I just didn't have very much money and I was trying to find a place to live. And I was like, kind of going getting broke and so I needed a roommate and so I mentioned to a friend that I needed a roommate he's like that's funny because there's this other guy who just told me today he needs a roommate let's go see him he's down beating corpses at the police station and it's like oh my god like that's exactly I mean they just took what happened in the book and they just put it in modern day it's a very faithful but elegant adaptation there well and and I I don't know the stories but from what I sensed, after the second season, they sort of lost 
that backlog of the story that they could just remake. And so well, it I felt think like they, they just were... stopped trying. Like they wanted yeah, to do something like they else. Were to make, they were trying to make something else up, and and it it worked <sighs> in some ways, but it didn't work in other ways. Like they were trying to, I don't know, do stuff with with the characters, and it. Just, I don't know. I, yeah. No, I totally lot. agree. And and I, you know, we kind of talked about this last time with the idea with with the Game of Thrones, where I feel like the places where the showrunners were like, let's do something else, they ended up making a misstep and that's not to say i don't think that you can you know go and do your own thing with an adaptation because some of my very favorite adaptations just are a big middle finger to the source material uh case in point uh, the shining like kubrick's the shining i that's one of my favorite films i really dislike that book and i think kubrick did some really great things by diverging from it well and and i think that's a choice that a lot of creators have to make is like do i stay completely to the source text or do I make something completely different? I feel like it doesn't really work if you start off doing one way and then you sort of decide, Oh, let, I'm going to make it my own and put my name on it. You know, it, it well, it, at very it, least you've got a weird tonal shift going exactly. on, which, because... which audiences notice. Yes, I, I definitely think so. And like, I mean, I don't know, like I, I'm sure that it's been done successfully where they like started with some source material and then just went somewhere. Okay. Um, I mean, they kind of started from a different place, but I, I'm going to bring this up just in every episode, but Hannibal is based (laughs) on, uh, red dragon and it starts out vaguely, you know, the idea it's like, okay, here's Will Graham and he's, you know, consulting for the FBI and he's trying to, Eventually, he's trying to catch the Tooth Fairy and all of that stuff. Um, it, you know, they immediately diverged by having Hannibal be, like, present in Will Graham's life and, like, a yeah. big character because in the book, Red Dragon, the two of them only, like, meet face-to-face, like, three times or something, which is very funny. <laughs> but, um, but like, I think that some of the best stuff that happens in that show is where Brian Fuller's, like, I'm making my own thing. Like, this isn't this isn't Red Dragon anymore. This isn't, you know, the Hannibal books. Like, I'm just going to make my own show about these characters. And I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, somebody who's a big, big fan of those books might disagree, though. Another show that comes to mind is um, True Blood. Oh, yeah? I haven't Wait. watched or read it. Uh, I haven't read it, but my best friend read it, and she, she loves to just fill me in. And I love listening to her film in because when she explains things, it's better than it's actually written. And it's just, I don't know. I just love it. Um, But what they did is they started off really close, but that's also because the book started off really simple. Okay. But then like shit just goes absolutely crazy with the types of paranormal creatures there are in the books. (laughs) And, and they tried to keep up in the show, but then it just got really messy and people stopped watching it because it was so strange. And honestly, it might have helped them if they, again, either stuck to it completely or if they had just done their own thing. And they did do their own thing in some ways, but by trying to keep these sort of characters that would not translate to screen very well, it sort mm. of like, like, like were panthers. <laughs> um, uh. Which, in theory, sounds cool and fun, but in practice is really weird. Yeah. Yeah. And then also fairies. Yeah, that's a hard one. That's a real hard one to do, is fairies. Yeah, bring, bringing fairies into a dark, seductive vampire romance? Yeah, very tough, very tough. On that note, a great example of um, fairy, like serious fairies done, done well um, is this Irish horror film I watched recently, um, The Hallow? It's it's got some issues as a film, but basically it's you know one of those monster movies, um, except that the monsters coming after you are Irish fairies, and it's great and scary, and the fairies are done super duper well. Um, the issues really are just with the like non monster movie part of it. It doesn't really have a very good subplot. The first half is just sort of like, all right, when are we gonna get going? But the the fairies are great and terrifying. So that's an example of that trope, like, totally working. I really love it when they do make a nice dark fairy, like in um, the the newest episode of The Magicians. I'm not going to give you too much because I want you to keep watching. (laughs) um, They they have some fairies, and they make a a real dark deal. Like, Uh. 
basically a, oh, fairies, you guys can save the world, but I have to really compromise my relationship with this person who is basically my best friend, but I'm not going to tell them. Uh. So it's, it's, I don't, it, it, the, the fairies aren't there for very long, but they make some waves. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and the thing that I really like about the Hallow is um, it gets back to the sort of mythological roots of fairies as, like, completely non-human creatures. Yeah. I mean, because that's the thing about Irish folklore and mythology is that um, they come in just all shapes and sizes. I mean, there are things that, you know, we sort of still know of in popular culture that we don't think of as fairies, but in sort of Irish folkloric terms, they are, like, selkies and... Yeah. Uh, banshees like these are all fairy creatures um and so the in the hollow they're like terrifying like forest monsters and they're really cool and that and nowadays i just think the word has taken on some very uh reductive connotations which is a is a pretty big shame um and I, you know this is a great transition because i i think that um it has sort of also led to the reduction in the scope of the word fairy tale oh yeah uh, which is just a, it's a big old bummer to me because I love old timey fairy tales, but, um, I know that, uh, an adaptation that you were, uh, sort of hankering to, to talk about was Beauty and the Beast, which just came out. Uh, is it La Belle et la Bette? La Belle et la Bette, yes. La... Yeah, um, so I was planning on going to see the, the new remake either yesterday or today, but. I did. <laughs> All right. And, Neither of us have seen it. I wanted to see it just so that I could make an argument against that. And honestly, that's probably not the healthiest way to spend your money. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's for the best that I didn't go see it. Um, but, okay. So the elephant in the room is the whole um, Disney introducing a, a gay theme uh... thing. So basically... For those of you who don't know, it's been going around the internet this since they've the whole Disney gay scene thing. Um, the lyricist for many of the early '90s, late '80s Disney films was a gay man, and he wrote the Oscar-winning music to Beauty and the Beast. And had a huge influence over the whole the story as a whole because they had no idea what they were doing. And he was fresh off success with um, Little Mermaid. And so basically Beauty and the Beast is already the gayest movie of all time. The original. Yeah. Because it's a, 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 it's a musical. B, <laughs> it, you know, a musical written by a gay man. It, you know, has... Um, and Very, just to, to talk, so you're talking about Howard Ashman here? Um, I think so, yes. I yeah, because he, he, he worked on um, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, um, and then some of his songs were included in Aladdin. And I just want to clarify so that we can we can speak more specifically about him. He collaborated with Alan Menken, who did a lot of the Disney music. Um, he was a yeah, playwright he's, and lyricist. He's the, yeah, he's the lyricist. He, he wrote the lyrics. Um, and he... I, I had, you know, it's one of those unspoken tales of create the creation of Disney films. Like he played such an important role mm -hmm. in the Disney Renaissance, but nobody ever talks about him or the fact that both him and his partner died yeah. of AIDS. And a lot of the themes in Beauty and the Beast, the animated film, relate to stigma caused by AIDS. So the Beast is this horrible disfigured monster that's been shunned by society and that's how a lot of people felt with aids and not just how they felt you know because they were you know affected physically but also because of how society and the government yeah, that's a really interesting way to, to think about uh the beauty and the beast i never really considered that angle before yeah i th somebody wrote an article about it and i and i wish i like logged all the articles that i read and I should, but anyway, um, basically describing how, describing all this that I'm reiterating, and it, 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 the fact that they've turned his legacy into this clickbait article frenzy about there being 
one small gay interaction in a remake of his movie is uh, yeah i mean would really it would have been better because my um what i have heard so far since you know the movie came out because people were getting a bit um fussy about you know this the 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 particulars of this character the the gay character is lefou um gaston's little sidekick guy and people were getting sort of um grumpy about this idea because they thought this was not a good choice and also not a good thing to sort of like be all proud of themselves about they're like oh yeah good job disney you took a minor villain villain character who people have been making gay jokes about for years and just decided to sort of subtly make him gay i don't know about it but what i have heard is that overall it it works and is fine you know not the most bold choice but not objectionable um do you think it would have been better if they just sort of let it stand on its own and just not really worried about it i honestly don't know what the best option would be and i think it's probably good that they did include something, even if it's not necessarily yeah. a fitting homage to Howard Ashman. Um, but I was listening to um, the Throwing Shade podcast, and they were talking about they went into detail of of what happens in the movie, um, and basically, there's another small henchman that has a small cross-dressing moment and likes it, and then he ends up dancing mm. with LeFou at the end. And, mm. I don't know, they were talking about how it's, it's it all reads as very stereotypical. It, it almost seems like how somebody in the 90s would have been trying to do this sort of <laughs> That's statement, really funny. you know? So, like, we've just gone back to 1991 entirely? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, if you're gonna do it, do it. that's just where Disney it. is has finally reached like as much as disney is a sort of a gay cultural touchstone they're they've been sort of stuck in the 1950s for a very long time they have because they had so much so much success there and they had so much success in the 90s which although gay issues were definitely beginning to come to the forefront in that time period they were certainly not treated with the respect no they deserved so I, I honestly don't have any advice for them on what they should be doing better yeah. because honestly they don't know what they should be doing and I'm sure they do know but because they're such a huge cultural powerhouse I'm sure they have a lot of you know various monetary factors that yeah well weigh. yeah and they do you know the Disneyland does the like gay day where they're like all right like this is a day when we're specifically saying like this is a this is a gay friendly space and we encourage gay people and gay families to come and have a good time in our parks um and that's you know that's cool and they do that you know despite a, a vocal population disapproving of it but i yeah i don't know i mean it is hard because they you know so much of their fan base is that is sort of a more traditionally minded demographic and and so for them they do have to sort of make the choice of like are we gonna you know are we gonna do the 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 cool thing at least as far as i'm concerned and like be inclusive or are we gonna just sort of not talk about it um and you know that's just that's disney tradition is to do whatever is gonna suit them best as a business like they've never done anything besides make smart business decisions yeah and i think honestly the biggest part of this whole thing is that um somebody wrote an article mentioning it yeah. and then it got out of control you know if if it, there hadn't been this whole internet you know buzz about it people probably would have been like yeah, oh that that's a cute, cute little that's thing neat. nice little Rather hey than... i guess they've decided to yeah. make lefou maybe gay that's cool but it like turned into a whole thing and got out of control well, and it, it got banned from several places Nobody because... Nobody even of, saw it or knew what happened, like if, and they just ban it. It's so dumb. It, it is, and I don't know. Again, I don't know what to do. I just, I don't know. I, maybe they should just, it, in sort of tribute, I would like from them... Maybe a yeah. documentary about well, do how they, it I mean, like, I wonder or, if, or, like, or, you know, dur during the credits, a nice gesture would have been... Like, just to say, like, in memory oh, would, of Howard Ashman or something that like that, because it was the last Disney film that he worked on when he was alive. So to just to, yeah, to dedicate mm -hmm. it to him I, or something. I think that would be something. And I, so I don't that know if they've lovely. done that or not, and having not seen the film, but... I don't either. I mean, 
Yeah, neither have I. Um, but I mean, he won the Academy yeah. Award. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For for. At, at, yeah. yeah so. Well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. I did listen to some of the songs. Yeah, though. the new the new songs. Yeah, and I wasn't a hundred percent happy. With Do that. you know who wrote them? Oh, oh, no, no, sorry, the, the new versions of the old songs. Oh, the new versions of the old songs. Yeah. Huh. I have, haven't heard the original songs. Yeah, I watched a little clip of, of Gaston, um, mm-hmm. and I, I just, I really love um, uh, Josh Gad. He's he's a delight. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the, he's the new Disney, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, he's the new phenomenon. guy. Like, he's going to do it. One uh one adaptation that I would love to talk about. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. I know a lot of people didn't because at the time I thought it looked terrible. But the 2011 adaptation of the Three Musketeers. I didn't see it. Nobody saw it. I didn't see it until just recently. <laughs> I am so sad I didn't watch it sooner. It's so fun. Okay, um, because I'm trying to remember, I can't remember the name of the director. He's He does all that kind of stuff, but, um, it's, okay, here's the thing. I, I, I haven't read The Three Musketeers all the way through because it's really hard to get through because of the way the novelists used to write back then <laughs> because, uh, you know, they were paid, you know, they they would write in installments, and so, like, each chapter yeah. would just get drawn out, and nothing would happen, and so it's really a slog to get through, um, because it's just, it, it just takes forever describing things and people, and it's just like, oh my god, can we get to it? But, ultimately, you know, it's a fun, swashbuckly action time, like, it's fun, and it's lighthearted, and it's, honestly, I think this adaptation is so appropriate and funny and fantastic so yeah it's it's directed by paul ws anderson um yeah i'm looking at his 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 credits right now he doesn't have the best track record well he's got an interesting track record uh let's i would i would agree with that i mean because yeah he did so he he's married to mila jovovich um and so she's in a lot of his movies um resident evil um three musketeers um yeah he's got a really really weird uh, filmography I there. I wouldn't say it's a terrible uh, list of movies. Yeah. Um, but there are some terrible installments. Like, Death Race, I kind of enjoyed, but the fact that there are two more <laughs> Death Races. Yeah. And he's making the Monster <laughs> Hunter movie, which is going to be weird. Um, Wait, what? Yeah, Monster Hunter. <laughs> it's coming out next year. <laughs> Does that need a movie? Yeah, no, it doesn't. But Paul W. Sanderson wants to make video game movies, clearly. He did Mortal Kombat. He did all the Resident Evils. He did Dead or Alive, which just super didn't need to happen. Um, yeah. But <laughs> The Three Musketeers, okay, I totally get why. Like, I thought it looked like the dumbest thing ever. But I think it's so appropriate and so fun it's just the campiest craziest movie it's got so many great people in it guess what guess who's in it mads mickelson is in it um, <laughs> but uh we've got so many great actors in it um luke evans is in it we've got uh christoph waltz is in it i love christoph waltz um and it's just, honestly as far as i can say it's it's honestly, a, it's a fairly faithful adaptation. Like, they, they do make some changes. Um, they do their own thing sometimes. But, but honestly, it, it, it's a pretty good sort of adaptation of the story. Uh, and it's just, I feel like it's really in the spirit of the book. It's so funny and wacky and crazy. Like, like in the book, um, D'Artagnan, he is just the boy who would fight everybody. He just is ready to just fight you and anyone else who wants to fight and he's absolutely the funniest little fighty boy in this movie it like <laughs> watching it i was just laughing my butt off because d'artagnan it's just he just wants to fight the whole world and it's so cute and hilarious and it's it's just it's a really delightful and i think underappreciated adaptation and i think people didn't 
realize how self-aware this movie is. Well, and I think also, especially in, like, the 20 teens, Mm. there's been a huge emphasis on grittiness and, like, if you're going to do a remake, you're going to make it gritty and realistic. Yeah. And camp has sort of lost its way, or it's been thrown by the wayside. Yeah. So maybe that's another reason. It's just people aren't necessarily looking for that right now. Well, yeah, and and it was back in in 2011 when that was especially, you know, sort of, coming up thanks christopher nolan but (laughs) but uh yeah like i totally get it like it looked like just absolute nonsense but the thing is it 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 meant to be like it it absolutely i think succeeded at being what it wanted to be it and and i celebrate that so much because uh, you know what like maybe it's not for everybody but dang did they make the movie they meant to make Mm-hmm. It's so fun. Like I really recommend it. You know they and and I think they. It, it's not only a, a faithful adaptation of the spirit of the book, but I think that it's a good job at translating that spirit into its sort of more modern incarnation. Because um, you know it's good swashbuckling, silly times. But uh, you know they they decide like to take the character of Milady, who's already like she's sort of a sneaky, conniving uh competent woman and make her just all the more competent and she's like a super cool mila jovovich like fighter girl as well and it's great there's she like whips off her big petticoats and she's like flipping around mila jovoviching all over the place and it's a lot of fun uh there's a lot of good comedy like i i just i was delighted by every moment of this movie and i i think that's adaptation done right well i i have the page pulled up uh, in the search, and it's sad that it has a 24% on Rotten Tomatoes. Not at all <laughs> surprised. I'm not at all surprised. I think it's a very misunderstood film. But I'm also just really into camp, and it's the campiest yeah. thing. And I don't know if that's something that a lot of rating systems put it as a factor, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't... I mean, I, and I think it's. I think it's just people not maybe understanding what it was going Trying for. Um, and you know what? Fine. Like, if you saw it and you're like, this does not work for me, that's that's chill. Like, that's that's for you. It's not for you. But, um, but oh, man, this movie is for me. It's such a good time. They're like, hmm, let's one-up this whole source material. Crazy sky ships. Yes! Uh, <laughs> like, I love that kind of thing. I love that nonsense. So, I think that any uh, conversation about adaptations of classics would be remiss if we didn't at least mention our dear friend, William Shakespeare. Bill. (laughs) Ah, Billy. My old friend Billy. I'm a big, big, big Shakespeare nerd. I've got, like, two um, complete works on my shelf. I've got a bunch of different books of, like, the individual plays. I will uh, tell you right now, I have 11 different formats of different versions of hamlet i have <laughs> i i'm a big old hamlet nerd um and there Hamlet's are like the one big one i haven't read you haven't read hamlet no i i don't know because i think either we just skipped it the year that i was we were supposed to read it in school or i don't know it's just the one that i i also feel like that's the one that is in popular media in so many places that everyone basically knows what it's about, even if they've never read it or seen it. Yeah, well, have you seen any of the, like, have you seen the Kenneth Branagh one or anything like that? I have not seen any of the... I, I'm gonna look to see if there are any weird, cheesy comedies based on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think Hamlet... I mean, okay, I'll tell you, the one cheesy comedy that's based on Hamlet is The Lion King. Okay, so everybody, yeah. <laughs> everybody's seen that. Basically, <laughs> honestly, like, as th- as they go, like... Lion King's a pretty great adaptation of Hamlet. Like, I mean, they changed the ending because they had to, but... No, there are about a thousand and two different adaptations of Shakespeare uh, plays, you know, in different formats. You've got, you know, all the sort of great classic versions of the, you know, film versions of of the plays. You've got, you know, all of the um, Laurence Olivier stuff, which I like. I gotta say, his version of Hamlet is probably my favorite because I gotta be pretentious that way. But he's just so, <laughs> so good. He's so, so good. But, you know, and then you've got the the m- more sort of loose adaptations like 10 Things I Hate About You based on Taming of the Shrew. 
Yeah. See, I'm I'm way more familiar with those loose adaptations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and a lot of people are. I mean, that's there's there's a well, reason. Well, a lot of people just aren't, aren't even aware that they are necessarily adaptations because it's so well hidden. Yeah. Well, like, who would guess that that Clueless is an adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma? Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, there's a good handful. Actually, okay, there's one um, really interesting, really, really well done, um, sort of loose modernization of Shakespeare. Uh, on the BBC, there was this miniseries called Shakespeare Retold. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I think I've heard yeah, of it. Each episode was an adaptation and, a, and an updating of a Shakespeare play. So basically, they took the general shape of things and they wrote a new modern story um following it you know a lot and things i hate about you uh, maybe a little more faithful than that um mm-hmm. but m- my couple of my favorite episodes of it are the macbeth episode starring james mcavoy as mr m himself it's mm-hmm. so so good because they take it and instead of being set in like a medieval scottish kingdom it's um in a modern sort of high cuisine kitchen Mm-hmm. And like oh. Duncan, the king is like this celebrity chef that started the restaurant, and then mm-hmm. um, Macbeth and Banquo are like his sous chefs that run everything. And it's so good. It's so 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 good. It sounds silly as heck, but it's it really works. It's very very effective. It's pretty creepy and fun. Um, but the best one is actually the adaptation of Taming of the Shrew. It starts, God, maybe you know her name. She's the actress who played Moaning Myrtle. Oh, I don't know her name, but I yeah, love she's her. she's this petite oh. little woman with this tiny little voice, and she plays the Catherine character, and she's so terrifying. She's so good and so scary and so funny. And then the- Shirley Henderson. What was it? Shirley Henderson. Shirley Henderson. Yeah, she's, she just- cracks me up and then petruchio the petruchio character is played by um rufus sewell who i just love um you know he was the guy you got to glower at everyone in the 90s he played a lot of bad guys um but he's just as just as funny as anything he's so 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 good and you know taming of the shrew is one that's difficult but always tempting to update um, because it's got some really weird, icky, like, misogynistic undertones. I mean, the taming of the shrew, like, ugh. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> like, Ten Things I Hate About You, you know, it's the idea of this woman who's just like, well, you know what, it's not even like that, because Ten Things I Hate About You, she's, you know, the 90s sort of, like, militant feminist thing going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Shakespeare Retold, she is... Like this, just hard nose um, Labor Party politician, mm. and she's just like just fierce and awful and unlikable. Like she's a good politician, but like people kind of hate her and are scared of her because she's just so severe and mean and scary. And th- so her like staff is like, "Listen, you have to like chill out and soften up your image because nobody likes you. You're scary and mean. Like you need to you need to sort yourself because people don't want to vote for you. People don't like you." Um and then the Petruchio character, he's never given a name. They because they don't want to like give him a new name, but they can't call him Petruchio, so they just don't really say his name at any point. <laughs> He's just like this, you know, silly sort of ne'er do well fellow, like he is in the play. Um, but he uh, he's like, I'm broke. I need a wife, and he meets Catherine and is immediately smitten, which is great because, like, how, like that's that's an obstacle, right? In Taming of the Shrew, the idea that it's like neither of these people want to marry each other. Yeah. Like, that's yucky and gross. And so in, he's, like, he's crazy and insufferable, but, like, he meets her, and he's just like, oh, my God, you're terrifying. That's the hottest thing I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> like he's super into it, and he's like, listen, you can't be mean to me all the time, but, like, I'm super into you and all this you've got going on. So that, it, it's, it's, it's definitely, a, it feels good to, like, make that change. One of the, um, Shakespeare remakes that I was really interested in, but I never finished actually, um, was the newer version of The Tempest. Oh gosh, which one was that? Oh, I it, it, it's around that same 2011 sort of time period. Basically, has an amazing cast. Um, let's see, 
Oh, God, was that the one where, like, um, Helen Mirren played? Yes. Yeah, Helen Mirren played Prospero, which is a fascinating choice. Yeah, it, it's got an amazing cast, but I, I, I think I either didn't finish it because it was just, like, too much, or... Or I think I like tried to find it through this shady website, and it was just a really bad quality that wouldn't load. Um, but I don't know. It, it it's it's gorgeous, and it's got an amazing cast: Russell Brand, Ben Wishaw, Helen Mirren, Alan Cumming, um, and the list goes on. Um, but basically, it's it, it. Just watch the trailer, if anything, because the trailer is is a gorgeous trailer. And I I haven't read the Tempest. I'm actually staring at a copy of it in this closet. Um, that I bought because I was excited about this movie. Um, Son, I will get you to read to all of these plays. It's, it's definitely something to revisit, and I've got time now to read, so... Yeah, just sit there and watch those teenagers do nothing. <laughs> and another um, really nice adaptation that I liked um, is a indie gay movie called Were the World Mine? And it's inspired by uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And it and it's not necessarily a remake. It's a little more of a like they're re- they're doing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream mm. in school, and it sort of follows along with this young guy's like coming out story, and the the theater teacher like plays this sort of puck role, and it's just really <laughs> it, I don't know. It's really magical and musical. It's basically they make it into a musical too. Oh, that's so it's fun. it's really fun. Um, and it, it sort of plays on the whole, the whole point of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's like, yeah, you can make somebody love you, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just right now. I'm just looking at the Wikipedia list of like Shakespeare plays that have been turned into to adaptations, and it's like a really long list. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, uh, speaking of the Tempest, um, the Derek Jarman uh, 1979 adaptation is crazy it's really good i mean it's it's 1979 so and it, it's you know the 70s were a crazy crazy time for film anyway and it's just it's really good and i think it's it's a really thoughtful fascinating adaptation but it is crazy yeah i think that's from what i've seen that's just true of the story in general so maybe that's my homework is to just, just what? dig deep watch tempest adaptations yeah it's i mean it's it's a good time but it's it's really bizarre yeah i mean the tempest it's like yeah we've got like a magician and spirits and monsters and everything so it's definitely the sort of most which is all up my alley so i i I should love it (laughs) yeah well i recommend um yeah i recommend reading it i recommend watching the stuff because it's it's a really interesting one and of course that one you know people like to sort of consider its connection to shakespeare's personal life because that was the last play he ever wrote and the idea of like this magician like laying down his craft is um sort of a fascinating parallel and and also prospero is like basically i mean is a narrator but also controlling i don't know it's it's obviously an allusion to a writer yeah i mean that's definitely a, a an easy connection to make um it's yeah it's 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 definitely a fascinating one to to consider in that way and honestly hamlet um probably is too because he had a son who passed away around the time that he wrote that one named hamnet so make of that what you will (laughs) i i honestly wish there were more like really weird versions of macbeth you know, there's one. I, I've had this Blu-ray on my shelf for months. <laughs> it's the newer one, starring um, Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard. Oh, I think I wanted to see that. Yeah, one. it's like set in the Middle Ages, which is oddly refreshing. Uh, you know, who to thunk setting a Shakespeare play when it takes place? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it looks just really cool, and I just I I'm I'm a bad I'm a bad one, and I haven't gotten around to watching it. Maybe that's the last thing I'll do with my evening while I still lay here, trying not to die. <laughs> uh, that sounds like fun. Just watch some spooky ghost times. I also need to look up some Othello uh, 
film because I remember that was I took a British literature course in high school instead of like the normal junior English class, mm-hmm. and we got to do um, we got to perform Othello in class, and it was just it was really fun, but also I don't know I feel like a lot of the topics in that really relate to modern politics. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean that that there's a lot to unpack, um, especially depending on how much sort of history you want to go into with that play because I think a lot of it's it's very tempting to misunderstand that play because of our sort yeah. of modern especially our modern American idea of race. Yeah. Um so it's it's very hard to conceive of the sort of racial climate that Shakespeare was writing in. Uh, yeah. Well, it's also a history too. So it's it's not even necessarily the climate that he was writing in. It was sort of like the, he was writing for the the climate that he existed in, but also the story takes place not where he lived. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing about Shakespeare is whenever he wanted to really like jab at society, he said it in Italy <laughs> because he couldn't actually talk about England that openly. So he's like, no, 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 no. This is Italy. This is Italy. This is how they do it in Italy, guys. Don't worry about it. You don't need to take it personally. <laughs> Uh, but there, there is a, I really, really want to see the, um, adaptation with, uh, oh gosh, well, Kenneth Branagh plays Iago and, uh, Lawrence Fishburne plays Othello. And I, and I want to see that very much because I'm a big Larry fan. Yeah. I just need to do a little more research and watch because I I really enjoyed performing that play. I mean, we did, we did it with the book, you know, in our hand because we're not actors it was just a classroom but it was a lot of fun yeah it's a it's a really interesting one that that um and the merchant of venice are real hard ones to know how to how to approach especially merchant of venice though because you know the question is just how anti-semitic was shakespeare (laughs) and it's hard to tell honestly i mean if you read that play like it's really complicated as far as, like, what he's trying to say. Because, I mean, ultimately, like, Shylock is a villain and a, and a somewhat comical one at that. Like, he's a real big stereotype, and it's icky. But, you know, he is sort of defended at times as well. And he there is, you know, there are some good things to say for him. So, obviously, Shakespeare's doing something a little more complicated than his contemporaries might have. And so, like, there's the um, Robert De Niro adaptation, which basically turns, like turns Shylock into this, like, tragic figure, which I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's certainly more palatable <laughs> to do it that way. I don't know how um, realistically faithful it is, though. Yeah. I, another one in that same class that I took that, that we got to perform was Richard the Third. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. And that one's, that one's another, like, really intense but also really fun to play because... I mean, you get to have a hunchback. Yeah. <laughs> and and I remember we watched uh, one of the adaptations for that class, and it was the one with, oh no, his name is escaping me right now. Uh, Magneto. Uh, Ian McKellen. I fe- I thought that Ian was McKellen who you were talking about. Like, Ian McKellen plays the main character, and you're just like, oh my gosh, he's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's good. You know, it's kind of fascinating though the idea of Richard the Third being played by such a very old man, because like when the real life Richard died, he was like got in his late 20s yeah. or something so you know i mean i get this sort of because of course shakespeare was very intentionally maligning the plantagenet family um you know sort of currying favor with the tudors because that was a good idea at the time so you know it, it's easy to just sort of pile on the sort of negative traits to to Richard, it's like, you know, he's withered and, and hunchbacked and evil and old and terrible, um, when in real life he was just a king trying to do the best he could, and he probably had scoliosis. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's that, and it's also, like, totally playing to his audience, you know? Yeah. A, a, a theater full of common people and also royalty... They're going to eat that up. That was the idea. He's like, hey, Bess, yeah, you like this. I am insulting your ancestors' enemies. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the, and there's just so much you can do with Shakespeare. I mean, the sort of 
just vast, vast quantity of adaptations of his work is really a testament to just what how versatile his works are and how much you can do with them because you can you know, I mean clearly people have set them in every time and every place imaginable and I, and I, I think it's honestly really valuable to a lot of us because I mean they're plays meant for everyday people but the, for us now it's really hard to digest them especially if you're reading them mm-hmm. um, and that's why they have like those you know other versions of the plays where it's like the modern day speech or, Mm -hmm. or that's, that's where watching one of the films can come in handy because either they'll do the whole, this is a remake where we're redoing the script or the actors, they usually choose actors that can help you understand what's going on without necessarily understanding what they're saying. Well, yeah, I mean, any Shakespearean actor worth his salt is going to be able to convey to you what's going on, even if you don't understand the language. Um, That's super important. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, Shakespeare's a great touchstone for sort of our thesis here because, I mean, you know, he was writing for for common people. Like, he was writing popular work. Um, yeah. but it, there's still so much there, so much value, so much to unpack, and we're still finding it, and we're still appreciating it today. Like, this is popular literature. This is, you know, this is the blockbuster of the English Renaissance, and there is so much there to appreciate. Like, there is stuff in popular culture that's so important and so worthwhile. I think it honestly circles back to the discussion of the weight of Disney, because... I mean, the the way they choose usually to make their movies is to make it really enjoyable for kids, but they leave little hints for the adults. Especially more recently. Especially more recently, and I think that's sort of the same thing, where it's like, these plays were for the common people, but it also has little jokes for the royalty. Yes. Also, you gotta give him credit for being the first, I don't know, written evidence of using the term douche as an insult. Does he? Oh my god, where is that? Do you know? He does. I don't remember but i want to say if you like look up list of like insults either he's he, I, I don't think he straight up says it but he, he basically is like you know one who cleansed like something you know but basically in essence he calls somebody a douche that is so funny like i'm gonna need to look into that because i gotta know yeah, i gotta I know to that that. I just, that's one of the things i remember from studying him in high school is like and and that's iconic if, if anything like that's the reason alone why he stood the test of time. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, boy, he made up a lot of fun things to say. Yeah. Uh, all right, so before we close the show for the day, I just want to give a little recommendation for a poetry, a small poetry book that I, I finished while I was teaching this week. Uh, it's called Inadequate Grave by Brandon Courtney um, from Yes, Yes Books. And it's like... The size of a pocket, so it's a little pocket poetry book. But basically, it's it takes a couple lines from the Odyssey, mm. and then it relates them to I'm assuming the the poet's time as in service in the Navy. Oh wow, that's so fascinating. It, yeah, it's it's and it's so gorgeous. Like you've never been so sickened and mystified by how someone can describe a drowning body. <sighs> It's it's amazing, and I and I wasn't when I first started reading it. I was like, I don't know this. I don't because I don't have any sort of ties or or um, it's hard for me to sort of connect to military minded people. But this definitely clicked in my empathy button. Well, that sounds very fascinating. And it's like it's tiny, and it's only like fifteen pages. So if you can find it. Uh, I would definitely try it out. Okay, and what was and it I called again? It's, it's called Inadequate Grave by Brandon Courtney. You could probably go to yesyesbooks.com, um, and you might be able to buy it from there. I got mine at Powell's. Okay, well, we'll try to but, put a, a link or something in the show notes. Yeah, let's look for a link, and I think a portion of the proceeds go towards veterans, if I remember correctly. Well, all right. Yeah, so you can't go wrong there. <laughs> That does it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song, Fraud, from his album, Artificial Heart. Until next time, remember, no no guilty guilty pleasures. pleasures.